Hey, church, would you put your hands together and help me to welcome our Bell Chase campus today joining us. And those online, we're so glad you're here. Church, I can't tell you how excited I am. I've been getting updates all day about what God is doing there. And today, I just realized, just right before I walked up here, that they're already in overflow. Come on, one more time, celebrate. We're excited for that. I want to give my congrats to Pastor Danny and Becca and the Bell Chase team. They've been working overtime to make sure everything has come together in a timely manner. And we just couldn't be prouder and more excited to be one church worshiping God in multiple locations today. It's one of those things that's always been in our heart as a, as a church that we would expand and that we would be a faithful voice in our city and we would preserve the church. You need to write that down somewhere because those are words that God placed in our hearts on what we should do in regards to other churches, that we should continue to make sure that we're faithful to honor Jesus, to talk about Jesus, but we're also going to preserve the church in our generation. It's an exciting day for us as a family. Hey, I would have never thought that in two years we would renovate two buildings and launch two locations. To God be the glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. I do want to say that our hope is that you would fall in love with Jesus and that you would discover a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Religion is life-sucking. It takes the air out of the room. But when you know Jesus, when you're close to Jesus, there's something special that happens in your life. And that is our desire for you today. I also want to just hit time out before I jump into the message. I've got two things that are really, really important as we begin this new year. This weekend is a special weekend for our nation as we set aside tomorrow to honor the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. And we as a church really espouse our responsibility and follow his dream for our nation. And we say it this way around here, that because of his passion and really the passion of the word of God, we, ha we have a desire to, and we've dreamed of having a church that would be generational, where young and old people worship together. Come on, old people, where you at? Just kidding. <laughs> Some of y'all clapped. I caught you on that one, right? We believe that young and old can worship God, and we also believe that God has called us to be an interracial church where black, brown, and white worship God together, that the stage looks like our city, that we, we have dynamic music. I like to say it this way, rivals the house of blues. You can enjoy and worship God. And today, in honor of Dr. King, I just want thank you for being a church that looks like what he always dreamed about that we don't care about your history your heritage or the color of your skin it makes no difference where you come from we are all made in the image of God and we're all called to do great things for God amen come on let's honor his life one of the most important things I think we do as a church is we tear down walls that have divided us and we build unity in the body of Christ. Now, that is exciting to talk about and I could probably spend the entire message just talking about our passion for that. I have something very uh, just, I like to say it this way, it's not exciting, it's not sexy to talk about, but I, I need to do it because it's the beginning of the year and we always do this every January. We take two Sundays aside and we do what we call a pastoral care update card. It is your connection card. Would every one of you grab it? It's in the seat backs around you. If you would grab one of these today, I'm asking every single person, if you call One Hope Church home, to take a moment uh, and fill out the connection card. Here's, here's what I want to do. As our church grows, and as we reach new people, and as we touch new lives, and people give their life to Christ, we recognize we have a responsibility to pastor you well, to walk with you, and to care for you. And heaven forbid, something happens this year, and we're calling the wrong number. We're showing up the wrong place and so take a moment to fill out this card and as you go you just drop it in the buckets as you go and we will honor your information do want to say if you're here for the very first time and you're like ah, I'm not doing anything like that can I just tell you we give you the hassle-free guarantee come on Bell Chase hassle-free guarantee I'm not showing up at your house Pastor Danny's not showing up at your house we're going to send you a letter this week saying thanks for coming to church here's some next steps here's how you grow here's how you get connected and so it's a very very safe card to fill out. If you got it, say, I got it. I got it. All right, let's jump into today's message. We're starting a new series today that we're simply, simply titled Big Rocks. 
Probably not the first time you've heard those two words put together. It is a popularized idea today that you need to build your life with some big rocks. And some of you who went to a good Baptist church probably had somebody in youth church kind of get a little clear bucket and put some big rocks and some small rocks. And they would say, if you let all the small things build up in your life and it fills your vessel, then you don't have room for the big things. How many of y'all are glad I didn't break out the final graph gra- and rock? Okay. Can I just make fun of our church history just a little bit? Come on, come on. Uh, so we're familiar with the idea of big rocks, and in this series we are. We're going to talk about some of the important things that need to be in your life first before all the distractions and all the other things show up in our lives. But to help you understand the importance of these big rocks, I, I, I need you to understand that there are actually obstacles and enemies to your health and your success. Do you realize today that you have obstacles to health and success and and that we have an enemy that wants to do everything he can to build up those obstacles so that we do not become the people that God always intended us to become? Can I just kind of break it down real life for you right now? We're in 21 days of prayer and fasting, and some of you aren't as familiar with fasting. And if you've got questions about that, you can go to our site, onehopechurch.com, and there's a lot of detail there to help you to understand why fasting is important. But I've been giving up anything that I delight, anything that I enjoy. I've been giving up all sugar. And can I just be honest with you guys? The king cake season starting early has been a real enemy to my soul right now. It's about 10 o'clock at night lately that I, I hear the words, cream cheese filled king. Anybody know what I'm struggling with here, right? Doesn't matter what you do in your life, when you start the process, when you start, I'm going that direction. It's like we have obstacles and the enemy just tries to do everything he can. And if we're honest today, some of us have written down the same New Year's resolutions that we wrote down in 2023. 2024 is going to be my year. And probably, probably last year you said you're going to lose 10 pounds. And this year you said I'm going to lose 3 pounds. (laughs) Because you knew you didn't get there. Why? Because there are obstacles and enemies. In the Old Testament of your Bible, there's a beautiful story. The story of David and Goliath. And it's a story that helps us to see that that we can defeat the bigger enemies of our lives. That we have, by the grace of God, the power to overcome him. If you're unfamiliar with the story, Goliath was a giant of a man. Matter of fact, he was like three men in one. He's about nine feet tall. He had been fighting since he was young. He was a valiant warrior, and he is taunting Israel's army, and he's challenging them to a one-on-one battle. Like, hey, one-on-one combat. Whoever wins, the other nation submits and surrenders to them. Can you, can you feel that pressure on the army? Like, who's going to go out? Like, I don't know about y'all, I like, to, I like to fancy myself strong and up for a fight, and like, I would be in there, nine foot tall, I'm waving, see you later, all right? That's, uh, I, I don't think God, unless God, right? Unless God called me to it. And in the story, we discover this young boy, David, who is the last of seven children. And when the prophet came to his house, his father forgot David even existed. I'm one of six children, I know what it's like to be forgotten a few times. David didn't even get called to the, to the discussion about who might be ordained king. And so now Israel is going to battle, and they've got this giant who walks out every single day. Think about it. Maybe in 2020 there was a giant that showed up in your life, and you were unable to defeat him, and you find in 2021 that the giant's still there and 2022 the giant is still there and 2023 you're like I think I can 2024 can I just say you have by the grace of God the ability to overcome every obstacle and every enemy to your hell and to yours you have the ability to do it this is what David is walking into he's walking into a demoralized army and he's delivering cheese and meat come on everybody I, I just love that I love some cheese and meat come on anybody want a charcuterie board later on today <laughs> I find it so funny that he's delivering that and his brothers David's like what's going on and his brothers say you you got to stay out of this you're just a kid but something rose up in David's heart 
and life. And we pick up the story, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. David says, don't worry about this Philistine. David told King Saul, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only, come on, say me, you're only a, a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Isn't that what the devil likes to say? You're just a kid. You're just too young. You're washed up. You missed your shot. This is what David is faced with. Faced with. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. Kind of sounds like a teenager bragging about things that he's accomplished, right? If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw. Can you hear the bragging going on right there? I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has, come on, read with me, he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally consented. He said, I, I got nobody else who wants to do this. And I got this kid who's like, I'm going to go. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped a sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. He, I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. And so David took off again. He picked up, read the next three words, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. And then he armed, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. If you've read the story before, you know how it ends. But Goliath starts taunting David. You're sending out a kid to do a man's job. You're sending out this little something. And, and he begins to taunt him. And the very next verse in 48 says, As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. I love his tenacity. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and he hit the Philistine in the forehead, killing him instantly. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell down on the ground and David took Goliath's sword and finished the job. All in one moment, all David had was a sling and a big rock, y'all. He, all he had was one truth, one principle, one belief that he went into the battle with. And I love this idea that it wasn't just a big rock, it was a smooth rock. It was something that he had developed. It was something that he knew that he could use. It wasn't random. He went to the stream saying, I know what I need in order to defeat this enemy. I know what I need to overcome this obstacle. And this, this series, for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about at least five obstacles to your health and your success in 2024. If you want to write them down, I'm going to give it to you fast. It's not going to be on screen, so you really do need to write it down quickly. Today, we're going to talk about how busyness is an obstacle to your spiritual growth, how that we're so distracted and we're not becoming the people that God wanted us to become. Next week, we're going to talk about how discontentment is an obstacle to an orderly life. You want everything, so you end up with nothing. Uh, the third week, we're going to talk about how unhealthy relationships are an, uh, are an obstacle to happiness. Today, if you're living an unhappy life, it's probably because of the people that are closest to you and the relationships you have. Week four, financial insecurity is an obstacle to peace of mind. We're going to talk about how that you can have peace and trusting that God is a provider. And then we'll wrap up this series with simply talking about how a broken life, how brokenness is an obstacle to a fulfilled purpose. The next few weeks, we're going to pull some big rocks out and place them in our lives. And you may say, well, pastor, I, I know some of these things. I've heard these things. Yeah, 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 I, I get it. But it could be that that rock needs to be smoothed out. So when it's placed in your sling, you can defeat the enemy. How many of y'all believe that 2024 is going to be a year that things change for your life? Anybody in the room have a little bit of faith that this is going to be a year that you're going to look back and say, that was the moment. I believe that if you will open your heart that today I'll stir some faith in your life. And like David, you'll walk in and say, everybody else is running away from the obstacles and the enemies, but not me. I'm going through them in Jesus' name. 
We are all facing, in today's message, we're all facing just constant distraction, constant busyness. If we're honest, some of us, even when we sit down to do things that we know are important, it's like you sit down and say, I'm going to take a moment, I'm going to read the Bible, then a phone call starts happening, right? You sit down and say, I'm going to pray, and then Instagram and the Facebook and uh, X, Twitterly, uh, Twitterly. What, what am I saying there? Formerly known. Formerly known. That's what I'm going to start calling it. Instead of X, I'm just going to say that, that place formerly known as Twitter. All the notifications start going off, and though you intended something good, what happens? All the distractions show up, and then you're running to this, and you're running to that, and you're like, you're, you're praying, you're jumping in the car praying, Hail Mary, and our Father who art in heaven. And you're like, well, I don't even do that anymore. But you just did it when you were a kid, so you do it now. There's a busyness of life that creeps in. There's a, there's a distraction that seems to keep us going in different directions. But listen to this key verse for today's message, Ephesians 5 and 15. The Apostle Paul says, so be careful how you live. Would you read the next few words? Come on. Don't live like... Y'all didn't do that very well. Can we try it one more time? Come on. So be careful how you live. Come on, Bell Chase. Don't live like fools but like those who are wise, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. In today's culture, we are all kind of going through life with three patterns, Paul says. It's an entire message in two verses. Here's one of the three patterns that you're living in. The first, write it down with me, is a careless pattern. You just... You know, you don't know, you don't care, and when someone asks if you do care, you say things like, who cares? Like, I, I don't have time for that. i got too many things. We, we've got so much on our plates that we're pushing aside the things that we should be careful with. We're acting carelessly about them. Paul says, I want you to live a, I want you to live a careful life. I want to I make sure that you understand that, that in order to grow, in order to overcome this obstacle, that you can't be careless about your development. You have to be careful. The second pattern kind of gets worse because Paul says the, the second pattern we get into is a foolish one. If careless people don't know and don't care, foolish people do know and don't care. You ever met somebody and come on, parents, where yeah, and you say to them, I told you this before. You know, I, I, if I've heard it once, mom and dad. <laughs> In my family, I'm one of six kids. When there was correction for one, there was correction for all. My mom would say, if you didn't just all of you line up in here, she'd start calling names. We didn't even know who she was calling. Sometimes she'd be saying names of kids down the block. And she would end it by saying, you know who you are. She'd line us up and we would start getting corrections. She'd say, you've heard me say it before. You know you're, suppo you're supposed to do. We're living in a careless world, but we're living in a foolish world where people know better, they just don't care. And they aren't doing those things. Paul says, man, don't live that way. Don't live, a, don't live a foolish life. Don't consider that you're going to win by going through, through life careless and foolish. And then the last one, he says, he says we're living in a pattern where we're just thoughtless. I, I read that verse, I'm like, I, don't, I can't remember a single time where I've been thoughtless. I don't think the problem is that we're thoughtless, I think the problem is that we have too many thoughts. We have so much information going around right now. The problem is, is you can't focus your thoughts. You're thoughtless because you're bombarded. You're ruminating on the negative. You're, you're fearing and worrying and going over. It, the word ruminate is literally like a cow chewing the cud. Over and over, you're, you're, you're chewing on the negative things and you're processing them over and over and over again. And he, Paul says, listen, a careless life won't get you there. A foolish life definitely won't get you there. And a thoughtless life that's just shooting at everything is going to end up missing the most important thing. 
So many of us are just waking up and shooting a shotgun in a direction and hoping we hit something. And what God really wants us to do is to, to, to laser it in and dial in that scope and say, no, no, this is what God has called me to do with my life. I think when you begin to live this way, you begin to think about your life differently because careless, foolish, and thoughtless people, you know what happens to them? They end up missing the opportunities that God has for them. It's only been a few times in my life that I showed up to the door of opportunity and showed up and, and I wasn't ready for it. What I want you to do as we begin this year is to begin to set some things in motion in your spiritual growth so that you're ready to seize the opportunities that God has for you. I don't want to walk by something and say, gosh, I missed that. That was my moment. You know, it's too late to prepare for an opportunity when it arrives. You have to wisely prepare yourself before the opportunity arises. So let me read the verse to you again. Ephesians 5, and let me focus you on the last part. So be careful, not careless, in how you live. Don't live like fools, but act like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. Would you read the next vo line? Every voice, come on, say it with me. It says, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. When you begin to live a careful wise and thoughtful life it's amazing how you can see ah that's what god has for me that's what that is what god is calling me to do and in order to do that we have to set aside the distractions and the cares of this life a bit and we have to focus ourselves on what god wants us to do in order to understand what the lord wants you to do we need to make time for spiritual growth i like to say it this way this will be the best year of your life physically if it's the best year of your life spiritually. So how do we overcome? How do we pick up the big rock and how do we smooth it out a bit? How do, how do we overcome the obstacle to our spiritual growth? How do we make sure that this is the best year spiritually? Well, I would just simply say to you, I've got three practical things to do, but I do want to say that our society right now is more open to a spiritual life than ever before. Just go pick up a movie. The movie is all focused on supernatural things and empowered people doing great things. We are interested in spiritual and supernatural. We've just disconnected it from God. And what we in the church need to do is reconnect the, our lives to a supernatural God. Our spiritual growth comes from God. Amen, everybody? The things that you're longing for aren't going to come just from the job. They're going to come through God, right? And then God may use the job or use the person, but it begins with God. How do you overcome the obstacle to your spiritual growth? Write it down with me. Number one, the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we're making time for personal learning. Personal learning. Instead of acting foolishly, we should learn intentionally. We like to say it this way around here, that as Christians, whether you just started following God a few weeks ago, whether you're kicking the tires today on whether you'll follow God, whether you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, in order to grow spiritually, you have to become a self-feeder. You have to start working on feeding yourself. Got any moms in the room? Come on, if you're a mom, wave a hand at me real quick. Any mom? Got lots of moms in the room. Moms, do you remember the moment like you just couldn't wait for the moment when they could feed themselves, right? And then they could go to the bathroom by themselves. I remember, I, Amber and I used to talk about it. I said, when I just stopped getting the call from, from the restroom, like, Daddy, can you come help me, right? I was like, when that happened, I did a dance. Oh, happy day. They can feed themselves, and they can go to the bathroom by themselves. Can I just tell you, as a pastor, as a bit like being a parent, that, that there are some of you that think you can survive on one message, one meal a week. That you can, you can be fulfilled. and No, no. Can I just tell you, there isn't a preacher alive that can give you enough in one hour to give you all the sustenance you need to grow spiritually. 
And so if this is going to be the best year of your life, you got to pick up the big rock of personal learning. you got to say, i gotta, I got to discover what small group I need to be in, what book I need to read, where I need to grow, because the message on Sunday is about moving us in a direction together, but maybe you need to do some work in one area so that all of us can do what we're called to do. When you're developing your children and they start to make choices about food, the first choice concerning food is, uh, is between junk food and healthy food. I've got two teenagers right now. I'm like, listen, four Debbie cakes are not going to leave you what, what you need to make it through the day. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Little, Deb, little, little Debbie is <laughs> not going to leave you little. You know? <laughs> That's like, <laughs> forgive me, Lord. And so I'm telling my kids, I'm like, you, you, you got to decide. You, you need a low protein, you need a little fat, you need a little carbohydrate. In our world, especially in America, we're a little heavy on the carbs and low on everything else. And so uh, my, kid, my, dad, my son came walking by eating a beef stick the other day. And he's like, look, Dad, I'm eating some protein, a little bit of fat. I said, yeah, but you ate all of the little Debbies first. The first decision is about junk food and good food. Let's liken it to our spiritual life. What are you going to eat this year? What are you going to feed on this year? What are you going to listen to? What are you going to look at? What are you going to, what are you going to bring into your spiritual life? Because you're going to grow in the direction of what you give the most attention to. And today, I, I applaud you, all of you, for being in church. Praise God. But tomorrow morning, you're going to be hungry again. Your soul is going to need sustenance, and you've got to develop. The first choice is between junk food and healthy food. The second choice is about regulating the volume and the timing of food. How much do you need and when? i got to tell you, i got to feed a lot to lead and carry what God has called me to lead and carry. And in 2024, I'm more desperate than ever for God to fill this place. 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved as a, as a workman to God, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. When I was in ministry college, I really struggled with memorization, so I, I bought some 4 by 6 cards. I had to get some big ones because the verses were long in college. This is just one of the stacks. This is over 25 years old, a lot of these cards. It's uh, hundreds of verses, by the way. Because every time I ran into something that was too big an obstacle, the only thing that got me through was the Word of God. When I was afraid for my life, I had to memorize 2 Timothy. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. One time when I was asked to walk out on a stage that was bigger than I deserved, thousands upon thousands of people, I remember going the morning before and sitting on the stage and praying and seeking God and quoting Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I, I want to challenge you to, to buy some 3 by 5 or some 4 by 6 and I, I want you to get a stack of cards and put them, come on, in the car. Don't, don't block the speedometer, everybody, okay? But you can, you can, block, you can block that tachometer if you need, right? And, and as you go through life, put it on the refrigerator how about we say it we spray it we paint it we live our lives learning the word of god listen the world doesn't need another self-help program the world needs the word of god we need him and can i can i just can i just encourage you as you go to scripture you get a little observation a little application and you take it to prayer a little scripture, a little observation, a little application, and you take it to God in prayer. And if I just kind of, can I hit time out? I, I know I, I, try to, I try not to be the pastor who stands on the soapbox a lot. Can I, can I just, I try to make uh, Sundays a little bit of fun and learning because I espouse what I call the Mary Poppins mentality. A spoon full of sugar helps the medicine go down. I want to I help you to smile, but every once in a while, can I just time out and be on the soapbox just for a minute? Because I, I do read your comments, even though I say if you email me, <laughs> I read all those things, and every once in a while, if I had something that Christians say most often, they say, I really like it, but I just went, we wish we went a little deeper. I just wish we, we did, and they got a, a special verse or a theology or an idea that they want for them. 
And I always say, praise God, you can go deeper. You can learn. You can grow. And they use words like, Pastor, I really just wish on Sunday we would, we would exegete the text. Some of you don't even know what that word means. It's okay. It's okay. But can I just stop for a moment? I'm going to be on my soapbox just for a minute. Just for a minute, all right? If someone is drowning, they don't need the Greek word for life raft. You know what they need? They need you to throw them a life raft. And today, I want you to know that if you want, we can have a conversation, and you can leave confused, wondering, and not knowing where to go. Or, or you can take some personal responsibility to keep growing and recognize that what we do as a community is about doing some things as a whole and feeding the whole and growing together as a whole. Can y'all receive this from me? Come on, thank you. Can the, can the whole church say Amen. Amen. I'm off the soapbox. There you go. No, I'm not. I got one more thing I wanted to say. Just kidding. Quite often, quite often when we hear that the people who are, they're wanting more head knowledge and they're not actually living out what they already know. And today I would say that a lot of people who want to just, they just want to go through the ideas of God, but they don't want to really follow God. I want to challenge you in this new year that if you want to grow, you need more than the idea of God. If you want your money to look like God says your money should look like, then you've got to do what God says to do with your money. If you want your marriage to look like what God says your marriage can look like, then you've got to do, you actually got to do that, right? Like, it, it doesn't, listen, you can't just think it, you've got to live it. Faith is not inside your mind. Faith is the action of your life. It's how you live live and what you do and too many Christians are living this idea of God without the power of God and in order to get the power of God you got to live according to the word of God the first thing we do in order to overcome the obstacle to our spiritual growth is we start we start taking personal responsibility start making some meals start planning your small group that's going to launch at the end of this month focused on the thing that your family needs to grow in you say, well, well, you know, I, I, maybe I need to have somebody teach me. Maybe you just need to have a friend who knows a little bit something different than you and get a book and you put out Doritos and a Coke and you say, every week we're going to talk about this until we get better. Second thing I want you to do, number one is personal learning. Second is prayerful yearning. Use the second word intentionally because it's a word you don't normally use in your life very often. But the Bible talks about how that we have longings and yearnings. You have desires. You have things that you want. And what we typically do in this world is we take our yearnings to the world to bring fulfillment to our lives. If you want to grow, you want to overcome the enemy to your spiritual growth, you got to start taking your yearnings to God. You've got to pray first, not pray second, third, or pray the Hail Mary football prayer at the end of the game. Like, I'm, I'm going to throw it up there. Maybe God will finally do something. How about we go to God first? Listen, as your pastor, can I just tell you, it is not easy to pray and fast for 21 days. But I'm dedicated to doing it now for almost 20 years consistently, praying and fasting twice a year, seeking God. Why? Because I need God. And I need God to know how much I know that I need him in my life. And so I'm set aside the, the time to seek him and to bring him my desires and my yearnings. Instead of acting thoughtlessly, we should live prayerfully. We need to develop a consistent prayer life. It's really how you grow spiritually. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about, say the next word, don't worry about. Instead, pray about. So he says, I don't want you to worry about anything. Anything covers any situation you might be going through. But he said, what I would prefer is that you prayed about it instead. And thank him for all he has done. I'm inviting you in this season to set aside some extra time to seek God. Just begin the habit of bringing God your requests first tell you, in business, uh, I've had multiple opportunities to both be pastoring and leading in business environments, and there's not been a single time that I've walked in not saying, God, would you answer this? Listen, there's not one time I sit down with you counseling or talking about your life that walking to the meeting, I'm not saying, oh God, give us wisdom, insight, and understanding. 
Jude says in chapter 1, verse 20, that you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. And you do this by praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. Today we believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. And when I don't know what to say, I pray in the Holy Spirit. I lean in and worship and I ask God to speak to me and help me to understand what I am supposed to do. I'm challenging you, church, in this new year to start some personal learning. Take responsibility to be a self-feeder, but I need you to start praying more. And can I be a little selfish? This isn't a soapbox. I'd be a little self. Would you add me to your list? Would you add my family? Quite often when God calls us to do something, we get to be the tip of the spear. It's a beautiful blessing and a privilege, but the tip sometimes, it's, it's kind of challenging to go first in every one of these environments. I am committed to go. How about you go with me in prayer and passion and seeking God? Here's the last, and we close today. I want you to focus in this new year on personal learning. Second, in prayerful yearning. And number three, in purposeful living. Instead of missing opportunities, we should prepare purposefully for what God wants to do. I like to say it this way. I'm a, I'm a strategic opportunist. I like to plan ahead and hold on and be ready. And then when God swings the door open, I want to run through the door. I tell our team, listen, I'm not pushing closed doors open, but I'm standing at the ready like a running back, waiting for God to put the, hand, the ball in my hands, and I'm going to run through the door that God has presented to us. In Revelation chapter 3, God says, what he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. He said, I know all the things you do. Come on, church, read it with me. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. 2024, this is a new year. It's an opportunity. This is your moment. And I want you to be ready. I want you to seize this year and make it all that God intended it to be. God is opening doors for us. And in order to walk through this, in order to grow, we, we just need to connect the dots between our gifts and our opportunities. You want to know what God wants you to do? Take your gift and draw a line to the first opportunity he has for you. You say, what's my purpose in life? Your gift and the opportunity that God gives you. Can I say it again? What's your purpose in life? It's your gift to your family, to your church, to your community and drawing a line and say, okay, that, that God's given me the gift of, of raising finances. Well, then I draw a line to making a difference with my finances. God's given me the gift of teaching, so I'm leading a small group. God's given me the gift of, you fill in the blank, hospitality, so you stand at the doors of the church and you're excited to see people or you drive the parking team golf cart. Come on now, right? That's really, that's next level, right? Why do you attend church? Why do I attend church? I could just simply say it's because God commands it. Or I could tell you the selfish reason is because I realize that faith is here. And when I'm in a room full of people filled with faith, I believe that there's nothing my God can't do. I come to church because when I stand shoulder to shoulder to you, something in me says I can run through a wall. I can overcome whatever it is because I'm not here by myself. This year you want to grow? Come on, make it a priority. Be in the house of God. Grow, with the, grow in the family of God. Why do I attend a small group? Why do I host one? Why do I lead one? Because I need somebody to connect with. I need somebody to know my name. I need somebody to protect me when I'm down. I need somebody to challenge me when I'm doing the wrong thing. You need somebody in your life. Why should you take next steps? Why should we do this? Why should we purposefully live this way? Because listen, if you're standing still, you're going backwards, y'all. Listen, we've got to take steps. We've got to grow. We've got to move forward. Why do I serve? And why do I ask you to serve? Why do I say things like you should worship one service and serve the other people who are worshiping the next service? Why do we say that? Because here's what I want you to be able to do. I want you to be able to begin the year saying everything God did last year, I was a part of. Hey, in 20, 
23, 133 people indicated that they made a decision to follow Jesus. Isn't that amazing, right? Can we celebrate their decisions to follow Jesus? But you know what the parking team gets to do? They get to say, well, we picked them up and we drove them here so that they can make the decision. You know what the kids' church team gets to say? We were holding their baby while that mama was drinking coffee, heard the message and gave her life to Jesus, right? The the Next Steps team gets to say, well, we were there when we connected them to the family of God. And what we all say is we're all part of doing what God has called us to do, each playing our individual role on the team. You need to, listen, personally grow. You need to start praying more because nothing happens without prayer. Thirdly, you need to connect your gift to the opportunity that's in front of you. So we close. Here's our final passage. Mark 2. When Jesus rep- returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Can you imagine if we just broke open a hole and and somebody just said, we couldn't get in, but we believe that this is the place that miracles are happening. They brought him in, they dropped him before Jesus, and Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. And he got up from the mat, and he was healed instantly. See, I love this, because Jesus knew what the man needed in order to be healed. He needed to get up. He knew what the man needed to get up and to grow. God knows what you need. And he wants you to grow in this new year. And if you're here for maybe the first time, you'll discover that there are people here who will grab your mat and your life and will carry you to Jesus. People ask me often, Pastor, how do you do so much? I just want you to know that I don't carry any of you alone and I don't carry any of you far. I just tear open the roof of heaven, right? And I say, God, you see my friend who's struggling with cancer and I carry you to Jesus. Today, as we close, would you bow with me in prayer? Come on at both locations. When a bell chase, just bow your head, close your eyes just for a moment. If you're here under the sound of my voice and you say, Pastor, it's a new year and I want to grow this way. In order to grow, you need to make a decision about your relationship with Jesus. It's possible that for some reason you find yourself far from God. Maybe. Maybe you never surrendered your life to Jesus. If that's you, I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand. I will not ask you to come to the front. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you make a decision to surrender your life to Jesus? If that's you, would you pray this prayer? Say these words right after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life my own way? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name.